Well, in a moment's time, Wadia is going to come forward and bring the word for us today. I'm going to read a few passages of scripture from Ephesians, Romans, and 1 Corinthians, and I'd ask now that you turn your attention to the reading of God's word. First passage is from Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. From Romans chapter 12, verse 3 to 5. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone that you, you not to think of yourself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. And lastly, from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though, are, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. This is the word of the Lord. It's given for our good. And I'm going to ask Wadia to come forward today. Good morning. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you this morning. May you instruct each of our hearts, Lord, this morning from your word. And may you receive all the glory. For Jesus' sake, amen. This morning, I would like to speak on belonging to Christ and to each other. How many of us this morning remember the three values in our vision statement as a local church here at Crestwood? They all start with the letter B. Believing the gospel, belonging together, and becoming like Jesus. Everyone who believes the gospel message is accepted by God and adopted in his family. Those who publicly confess their common faith in Jesus Christ are joined together in a local church. It is in the community that we pray for each other and for our community. We worship God together and we encourage one another. The church is a place where every person who believes in Jesus belongs together as a member of the household of God. Now, the Bible is full of teaching about the church. If we lack interest in the church, we lack what Jesus or what for Jesus was a consuming passion. In Ephesians 5, we are told that Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. And according to scriptures, the church is not just another institution created by a religious establishment. It is the people of God and the body of Christ. So what's our challenge or what's our obstacle to belonging, to being a member in a local visible church? Is it our fallen nature? 
Is it our individualism? Is it our pride? Is it our tendency to go it solo in life? Cyprian, a third century bishop in North Africa, famously said, no one can have God as father who doesn't have church as mother. And that remains true. Think about it. Another theologian said that it is as impossible, unnecessary, and undesirable to be a Christian all by yourself as it is to be a newborn baby all by yourself. In the Old Testament, the book of Numbers registers the names of Israel. Have you ever asked yourself, why does God's inspired word in that book of the Bible seem to read like a telephone directory? The answer, according to Ed Clowney, which is one of the Westminster professors, it is the privilege of being named as a member of the Lord's assembly. In ancient Israel, you belong to the assembly of God's people because you belong to the Lord of the assembly. Hear what Jeremiah says in 1023. Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their path or direct their steps. And Isaiah 43 declares that God created you and me and he formed us and he tells us, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. We are not our own. God has separated us to be his. To the children of Israel, he said in Leviticus 11, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. Furthermore, he says, you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. Now, speaking to the first century Christians, Peter takes those very concepts from Leviticus and applies them to the Christians of the first century, Jews who became Christians, Gentiles who became Christians. Peter takes that notion and he says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And as it was for the children of Israel, whom God rescued from bondage and slavery in, e in, slavery in Egypt to be his, God has rescued you and me from the worst bondage, the slavery to sin, now you belong to God. Now you belong to him. He has made you his. To be God's chosen people was a great distinction for Israel, but now Peter is calling the church by the very titles that were so precious to Israel. And he gives these titles to a church made up principally of Gentiles like us. We're all Gentiles here, as far as I'm aware. The names of God's chosen people were known to him before the foundation of the world and are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, as Revelation tells us. So, the first point in our outline here is you belong to God's people. Remember that you and I did not belong to God's people. We read that. And Ephesians, we are reminded again that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision which is done 
in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in this world. And now, you are a fellow Israelite. You are no longer a foreigner. You are included in the commonwealth of Israel, the church, the larger, newer Israel that God has created by the death of his son and his resurrection. As the Lord says through the prophet Hosea, referring to the Gentiles, again, that is you and me, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. Now, in Jesus, we belong in God's family. This is a great an incredible turn of events. Now in Christ Jesus, we belong to God's family. We are one family. You've joined God's people in space and time when the Holy Spirit enlightened your heart and mind, calling you and drawing you to Jesus. The Spirit of God opened your eyes to your sinful state, your broken relationship with God, who is your maker, the Spirit convicted you of your sin, your alienation from God, and then he applied into your life, mind, and heart the riches of the redeeming grace of Jesus. And when this began to take place in your life, you were restored into friendship and fellowship with your Creator and Savior. Let me pause and ask. Have you heard this good news and have you received Jesus by believing that he came to live the life that you and I could not live? Die the death that you could not die and give you the power and the promise of his resurrection life to live now and forever. Then, if that's true of you, you have become a fellow citizen of God's people, of God's household, of the church, which is a colony of heaven. Think about it. In Ephesians 2, verse 13, Jesus changes everything. He brings us near. We are no longer foreigners and strangers, fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, members of the church of Ephesus got this incredible news. And it is the same news to those who belong to the church of Jesus in every local congregation, including here at Crestwood. Charles Spurgeon said that some Christians try to go to heaven alone, in solitude. Then, Charles adds, but believers are not compared to bears or lions or other animals that wander alone. Those who belong to Christ are sheep in this respect, that they love to get together. Sheep go in flocks, and so do God's people. Paul, in today's text, introduces the teaching on belonging to the visible body of Christ, the local church, by using a powerful analogy, an anatomical unity of a physical body with unmistakable implications. To paraphrase, a body functions well when all its members work together as it would be dysfunctional if each organ acted in a disconnected way. First, the members of the body are organically belonging and connected to that body. One member of the body cannot tell another, I don't need you. Imagine for a moment that your eyes tells your hand I don't need you. 
I can make it on my own. How functional do you think each member, how, how sorry, how, how do you think when the eye tells the hand, I don't need you, how do you think the eye-hand coordination can happen if each of them are working separately? Belonging to the body is what, what makes each member function as they ought because we belong to one another. And all members of the body, though distinct in roles and gifts, cannot function on their own. This is the scripture's anatomical analogy given about the church. And imagine in your body, different organs work on their own. Okay. Doesn't happen, of course. And so, how is it that we treat the church in the same manner? We are all coordinated by the head, who in every local church is the Lord Jesus himself. Another name you might recognize is Nicky Gumbel, the alpha pioneer and teacher. He famously said, church is not an organization you join. It is a family where you belong, a home where you are loved, and a hospital where you find healing. Do you belong to God's flock? in a local body of Christ? Secondly, now you belong to God's visible church because you belong to Christ. So the second point is you belong to Christ. That's the reason you belong to a local body of Christ. God the Father gave you and I to his son Jesus. This is stated in John 17. Jesus addresses his father and he says, I have manifested your name to the man whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. What does it mean to belong to Christ? You and I are his father's special possession. Think about that. You are Christ's by redemption. You have been redeemed by his precious blood shed for you on the altar of the cross. You are no longer your own. That's hard for us to hear many times. You are no longer your own. You belong to him. You are a bond servant of Jesus. What is a bond servant? It's a person who serves in bondage. It's a slave. A person bound to service without wages. The word bond servant is a translation of the Greek word, and that's all the Greek I'll say today. The word is doulos, which means one who is subservient to and entirely at the disposal of his master, a slave. This is different from the Greek word diakonos, where we get the word deacon, which is also meaning servant. Every Christian is a bond servant of Jesus Christ. You know, in Roman times, the term bond servant or slave may refer to someone who voluntarily served others. But it usually referred to one who was held in a permanent position of servitude. Do you realize that in your daily life? That you are in a permanent position of servitude to your Redeemer and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Under Roman law, a bond servant was considered the owner's personal property. We are God's special possession. In many New Testament books, the word bond servant was used in reference to a person's commitment to Jesus. 
most of Paul's letter begin by referring to himself as a servant and or a bond servant of Christ Jesus. James, in his letter, Jude, brothers of Jesus, both refer to themselves as Christ's bond servants. Now, the importance of these New Testament authors referring to themselves as bond servants cannot and should not be overlooked. Despite proclaiming a message of freedom from sin in Jesus, these writers were dedicated to Jesus as their one master. Further, their service to the Lord was not one they could consider leaving. Yeah. Today I can serve, tomorrow I will not. When God calls me to serve, oh no, I'm not available today. I have to bury someone. I have to marry someone. The, the, the ownership of God of your life is your priority. Just as bond servant was more than an employee who could leave for another job, these Christians were servants who could never leave their master for another. This belief and understanding of the Christian as a bond servant played an enormous role in the early Christian's life when they often faced persecution. Peter, Paul, and James are traditionally recorded as dying for their allegiance to their master, Jesus. And what does the Bible tell us about who is the supreme bond servant who is to be our example. It is the Lord Jesus himself. Listen to the word in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, where it says of Jesus, who being in the form of God did not, er, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, Jesus, and coming in the likeness of of men. Jesus emptied himself. He humbled himself. He relinquished his heavenly status, not of course his divine being, and became a bond servant and a slave. He submitted to his father's will and he was obedient to him throughout his earthly life. His supreme expression of obedience was his death. Jesus is yours and my example of what it means to be a bond servant. And here is the good news. When you belong to Jesus, all of God's promises in him to you are yes. Think about that. Remember, you are no longer your own. Jesus calls you to identify yourself with him, with his church, now that he has brought you into the fold. Or how else then would the prayer in John 17 for unity and for knowing and being kept in his truth, how else would it happen if you don't belong? My final point, which is um, number three there, or... The third one is, what are the practical implications of this teaching that we belong to God's people, church? So ask yourself, in what part of my life have I functionally forgotten that I belong to God's people and to Jesus? Pastor Peter Adams, who is a PCA pastor in the United States, wrote an article, and I have um, read this article, and a lot of what I am going to share now is a lot of the thoughts that I've seen from Peter Adams. The first implication of belonging to the local body of Christ is this. You and I need the regular support and encouragement of Christian fellowship. The Christian life is not designed to be lived in isolation, and those who try it that way are likely to crash. Hebrews 3.13 says, exhort one another every day. Exhort one another 
every day as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Let me ask you, do many of your daily preoccupations suggest that you belong more to the world or to God? A little criticism makes me angry. A little rejection makes me depressed. A little praise raises my spirits. A little success excites me. I am like a small boat on an ocean, completely at the mercy of its waves. Titus 2 tells us that the fellowship provided by Christian friendship is no substitute for belonging to a church. You choose your friends because their ideas and their style are similar to your own, but God puts, God puts different people from a variety of cultural backgrounds at different stages in their life with varying interests and gifts. He puts all that into a congregation so that they can learn from each other and learn to live together as an in one body. Take the notes home, Titus 2, 1 to 10, and read over that. So while parachurch ministry teams, evangelism teams, Christian societies can be beneficial, they are no substitute for the church. Special groups and teams are more exciting than churches because they attract people of similar aims, ideas, abilities. They do good work, but they're not the same as churches because they are limited in their membership and their interests, their tasks. On the other hand, churches accept every professing believer regardless of gifts or skills or status so that the churches may accurately reflect God's free grace. How much do you recognize God's free grace in all the people that are around you here? The second implication, as was mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, they te it teaches us that membership in the local church works by providing the analogy to the members of the human body. And why is it doing that? It's pointing out the fact that gifts can only rightly be used by someone who is a member of the church, like it was in the Corinthian church, like it was in the Roman congregation. We read these texts, but we forget the context. Paul is addressing a local congregation. It's called the Corinthian church. He is addressing a Roman congregation, and he is talking to them about that unity of the body and the members of the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Your gifts are not for you. You behave sometimes, I behave sometimes, as if, ah, my, my talent is for me. That is not true. That is selfish. God has gifted you so that you do it for the common good in the church. And, of course, in serving wherever he places you in this world. Because I'm not a hand and I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason that you stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason that you stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 12, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. God is the maker of all this. Not the church people. God. Read his word 
carefully. There should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. And then Paul tells the members of the church of Corinth, Now you, Corinthians, are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Again, I say gifts are primarily for the congregation, not for the individual, and they are rightly used to build up the church. The picture of a church as a body tells us that our various gifts complement each other. You don't see a foot or an eye wandering around by itself. And just as the Lord filled members of his Old Testament community, the children of Israel, remember when they were building the tabernacle for the Lord? And the scripture is fantastic. I love it that in the Old Testament there is a clear statement that God gave his Holy Spirit to people of that time in Exodus 35, 36. You can read that. And how these gifts were given by the Holy Spirit so that you are a good uh, weaver, you are someone who builds something, and it talks about that's the Holy Spirit that's making you do that. You are a good piano player. That's the Holy Spirit that's given you that. You are a good reader in the scripture. That's the Holy Spirit that's given you that. And not only it says that he gave the Spirit to those workers, but he gave the Spirit specially to two guys to teach other people. And that's what God does in the church. And so just like what happened in the Old Testament, in the same way the Lord fills the members of the local congregations with the same spirit to do the works of the ministry. Another implication to appreciate is that God's basic unity, unit is a church, not the individual. God's basic unit is the church not the individual. The story of the Bible is that of God making, shaping, refining his people, beginning with an individual. His name was Abraham. And then growing it from him into a community and a nation. And the lives of individuals like David, like Isaiah, like the disciples, like Paul, have their meaning because they are part of God's continuous community. It has lasted 4,000 years. And there are no signs that God has changed his plan. Without belonging to a local body of Christ, you are not paying the price of being a Christian. The solo flight is a very attractive style of Christianity for some, but it evades a basic element, the cost of discipleship. Jesus called his followers to serve their community of faith, to be a slave to all. Ephesians says in 521, submitting to one another, out of reverence for Christ. A fourth implication is that the New Testament is properly understood when you belong to a church. Most of the New Testament is addressed to churches. How would you like you to come, go home and start reading how many churches are addressed in the New Testament, including, don't forget, the book of Revelation and the church is there. If you only read the Bible privately, then you will not be in the right place to hear God's word. You will privatize its message, and so you will misunderstand it. And basic maturity in faith and knowledge is only found in the church of Jesus. Because maturity and fullness of faith are discovered as a corporate experience, as a body experience. We learn and we grow together. This is not my invention. Again, Ephesians 4, you should read the, the various gifts Jesus gave to his church when he ascended. Are, they are given to equip the people, his people, for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. This is a corporate experience 
until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Jesus Christ. You know, listening to sermons online can be profitable. It's not a bad idea, but it is not a substitute for receiving God's words in the church that you belong to. Because we need people to whom we are accountable for our hearing of God's word. The sermons you need to hear on Sunday are to be from your church ministers, your elders who shepherd you and who love you and who pray for you. Many times, we cannot assess the lifestyle of someone we hear online. We don't know them. We, are, we, we cannot assess their message. It is people whom we meet that are able to evaluate us, and we are able to evaluate them. One more implication. In the church... Sharing in baptism and in the Lord's Supper is basic to Christian obedience. We share in these sacraments because of the command of Christ. They are not private rites. They are corporate actions of the body of Christ. Sharing in them means belonging to a church. Listen to Paul speaking about the Lord's Supper to the church in Corinth. He says, for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ. That word body is not referring to the bread element. It's referring to the church. People in Corinth were getting together and sitting at the Lord's table and eating as if they were having a regular meal and not realizing that when they got together as a church, this was the sacrament of the Lord's Supper but it is in the context of the church that we share in the sacraments of the Lord. And what do that, does that make? Is that it, they were eating and drinking judgment for themselves. Finally, submitting to Christian leadership is an integral part to the New Testament Christianity. In Hebrews 13, 17, the Bible teaches that Christians are called to obey their leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. You know, going it alone is okay in the short term, but eventually you and I will err and wonder if we imagine that we don't need structures and human authority. And God's provision of order and authority in the church is his realistic way of helping us and is actually a gracious gift to you and me. To close, in the Heidelberg Catechism, the most familiar question and answer is, what is your only comfort in life and death? I'm sure many of you can recite that. That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Belonging to Jesus is belonging to the head of the church. And according to Ephesians 2.10, the result of this belonging is that since we are God's handiwork, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared for us in advance to do. Now, as new creations saved by Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit, we will be able to function as men and women were intended to function, as members of his body, gifted by him to do the work of the kingdom. The gift being the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And since you and I are not our own, we belong to Christ, who is now seated in heaven. But you and I are his bond servants. We are to serve his community, the visible local church where he dwells by his Spirit for his glory, to build it up 
spiritually, just like the Old Testament tabernacle was built physically according to God's design and for his glory. You and I need regular support and encouragement of our fellow members in the local household of faith. Together, as a church, we are God's basic unit, where we may grow as a community and where we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We will together, as a body, experience the unity in the faith and the deepening knowledge of the Son of God. We will share in his sacraments. We will be shepherded by the leaders appointed to keep watch over our souls. And those leaders will be accountable to the head, Jesus. Will you join to serve as God has called you? Will you belong? Let's pray.